Today, we're going to be diving into Sir Philip Sidney's defensive posy as we continue our search for his connections to not only Shakespeare, but the entire Elizabethan Renaissance and Jacobian scene. So stick with us as we dive right into it on this next episode of Apocalypse's Historia. back with another episode continuing uh on to part two of maybe not a hopefully super multi-part series yeah <laughs> we yeah could probably spend i mean this is a while on this, this is a long essay like yeah. every other essay we've gone through has been what 15 20 pages max um we haven't like i mean when we went through stotzenberg we just picked out little bits and parts but this one like yeah sydney's just spitting out gold here page by page by page and um whether or not it's even shakespeare authorship question because like if you're just somebody that's interested in literature somebody that's interested in this history or this era if you're somebody that's interested in writing like as fiction or poetry or drama as a craft like this is this is a beautiful perfect guidebook like it's got philosophy it's got uh classics um this is just an awesome essay uh, so, yeah, like, we're going to continue diving into this. Hopefully we can finish it up in one more part here. Um, but if not, stick around. We'll, we'll do we'll do some more. Um, I guess real quick before we dive in, just want to continue giving some shout-outs to our commenters. Um, um, got a, a new commenter that I, I saw was dropping some comments on. Uh, Brady put out a, a new video that's not related to our Shakespeare authorship question, but it kind of goes into some of his esoteric research and he's got kids and so he's been watching cartoons and stuff and he's wondering maybe what some connections are but i think commenter is what the real human earth or, or something like that um just dropping some great comments on some of our videos lately um vet stadium keep dropping comments uh, i promise you we're not completely anti-oxfordian um you know uh i don't want to get too political but Getting us getting called anti-Oxfordian does kind of remind me of what I'm seeing in the news with uh, there's some like Israeli or Jewish professors that are stepping out and trying to defend people's right to free speech, even if it's for pro-Palestinian stuff, and those people are getting called anti-Semitic, and so it's like, how can you call a Jewish Israeli citizen anti-Semitic? Like, um, that's uh, you know not to equate us totally on that level, but. Uh, yeah, we're totally, we're, we get attacked by Stratfordians in several of our videos that, hey, you think Oxford's Shakespeare? Like, you, yeah, darn skippy, we think he's Shakespeare. <laughs> we just don't think he's the only Shakespeare. We think that there's a lot of Shakespeare's, and um, maybe we do have to, at some point, put out a video that gives good enough reason and structure as to why, but that's not really what we're doing here today. We're just generally pulling back from specific authorship questions and saying, what is influencing Shakespeare? Because, um, you know, there's a book behind Brady's head, Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. Giant novel came out in the 90s. Maybe some of you guys are familiar with it. Infinite Jest is itself a line from Shakespeare. But his favorite writer is a man named Thomas Pynchon, and it's also one of Brady and I's favorite writers. And Thomas Pynchon, his favorite writer... Favorite writer and favorite enemy, too. Like, yeah. <laughs> reading some of his stuff, And, but. like, uh... Thomas Pynchon's favorite writer is Oakley Hall, and Oakley Hall's fa do love. <laughs> Oakley Hall's favorite writer is Bret Hart, and Bret Hart's favorite writer is Charles Dickens, and Charles Dickens' favorite writer is probably Shakespeare. And so it's like, you know, there's a long list and a chain there, but look, David Foster Wallace at the end of it's naming his most famous novel after Shakespeare. And so it's like, does it just stop at Shakespeare? Is Shakespeare Wait, what the is Infinite Jest from? Uh, what what play is that from? Uh, I believe that's Hamlet. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hope hope I didn't just show my cards there, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, um. So like, is, is it just full stop at Shakespeare? That's the root of all influence in all American literature. Like, yeah, almost like. <laughs> like uh, uh, Surely not, right? Surely it goes farther. And yeah, okay, sure, he's reading, uh, you know, Plutarch's uh, Lives of the Romans. And yeah, sure, Shakespeare's reading Holland Shed and Hall's Histories, maybe some Ovid. But like, 
who from his time period or previous to his time period is the one that said, man, I got to start writing or man, I got to, I got to write a certain way. Um, perhaps it's coming from the stuff in the eighties, like Sydney and maybe others like Oxford, maybe others like North, uh, but specifically it's this essay that we want to dive into to say, look, this is like a guidebook, right? Like, and I, we said it in our first uh, part of the episode, that this is just a perfect guidebook. Yeah, almost a dummy's guide to writing Shakespeare before right. Shakespeare's even there. And like, yeah, a, a dummy's guidebook to like literary criticism. So let's dive, dive in real quick. Um, we ended on, um, in our last video talking about one of my favorite lines where Sidney says, I say again, not the fault of the art, but that by few men that art can be accomplished. And so that Sidney saying, look, I don't think that, you know, poetry is bad. I don't think that drama is bad. It's just that very few people ever have been very capable of doing this well. Um, and that said, he's sitting here arguing that poetry's like, really important so if like very few people can do it what's the payoff well he says for conclusion i say the philosopher teaches but that he teaches obscurely so as the learned men can only understand him that is to say he teaches them that are already taught and uh there's you know some truth to that like who's who's reading old obscure f philosophy texts it's philosophy professors and it's like well, how is it what what good is that knowledge doing if it's only a certain small select you know esoteric group that's getting this info um how, how do you reach a larger audience and um that's something that like brady and i have been like really trying to cope with with this new youtube channel are we trying to just go for the, the, the learned bunch that are up to snuff on all the authorship question readings? Or are we trying to talk with a more armchair audience? Or are we trying to draw people in that aren't even aware of that question? The Zoomers, man, we want them. No. Yeah, and um, so like that, that's a, it's a good question. And Sidney may have an answer for us here. And he says, like, you know, the philosopher teaches, but the poet is indeed the right popular philosopher um that is the poet is the food for the tenderest stomachs um aesop's tales give us good proof whose pretty allegory stealing from the formal tales of beasts make many more beastly than beasts begin to hear the sound of virtue from these dumb speakers um which i like dumb speakers like he wasn't talking about electronic speakers but it makes me think of speakers that don't work um, <laughs> um, but the fact that like with a story structure with poetry with fiction you can all of a sudden give another layer of telling the story uh, give give another layer to how you're relaying information yeah you can't just you know force feed philosophy dense philosophy it's sort of spiritual stick you know they'll choke on it right it won't make price the and blood brain bear you know so you gotta you know so much of it has it to be learned bit. and practiced to yeah. some extent and how do you learn it and practice without getting them to do it well maybe show them somebody else in practice yeah all right i feel like just the use of talking about animals and making them kind of act out the characters i just gotta get a um, animal farm kind of vibe and you know there's even a bunch of great quotes from that you know uh all animals are equal but some are more equal than others yeah and so, yeah that line just kind of yeah is a uh, really you know eternal and um and you know um we've been having all this ox and ass you know conversation yeah, with yeah. these symbolic animals that are maybe allegorically placed um but uh if we continue farther he talks about um historians and um because, you know, we got the philosophers, we got the historians, we got the poets. Those are three ways of telling somebody a piece of information. Um, you know, the, the philosophers are going to tell you it directly. The historians are going to tell you somebody else that did it. And then the poets take it one step further, and they don't just show you somebody that did it. They show you some fictional hypothetical realm, some platonic Arcadian realm. Um, 
and so he says, if the poet do his part aright, he will show you in Tantalus, Atreus, and such like, nothing that is to, not to be shunned. Um, in Cirrus, Aeneas, Ulysses, each thing to be followed, where the historian bound to tell things as things were, cannot be liberal, without he will be poetical, of a perfect pattern, but as in Alexander or Scipio himself show doings, some to be liked, some to be misliked. And then how will you discern what to follow but by your own discretion, which you had without reading Quintus Curtius? And whereas a man may say, though in a universal consideration of doctrine, the poet prevaileth, yet that the history in saying such a thing was done, doth warrant a man more in that he shall follow, the answer is manifest, that if he stand upon that was, as if he should argue, because it rained yesterday, therefore it should rain today, then indeed hath it some advantage to a gross conceit. This is one sentence, by the way, folks. But if... He know an example only informs a conjectured likelihood, and so go by reason the poet doth so far exceed him as he is to frame his example to that which is most reasonable, be it in warlike politic or private matters, where the historian in his bare was hath many times that which we call fortune to overrule the best wisdom. Many times he must tell events whereof he can yield no cause, or if he do, it must be poetically." So that was all pretty much one sentence for that entire paragraph. Um, it's one big question and then one big long answer and then one short sentence at the end. But uh, if we can kind of decode what he's saying here. He's saying, look, uh, the historians are absolutely limited to whatever their knowledge of history is, for one. Even if they have a complete knowledge that's still limited to one particular iteration of how things could happen in a certain situation. And so, poets, fiction writers, have complete freedom to just play with any hypothetical with any situation, and a good poet, mind you, not many can be very good, as Sidney said, but a good poet should be able to use reason and experience and this natural proclivity towards human psychology maybe like Shakespeare to render history or render life so as to be up to a certain standard of verisimilitude like it, it's gonna feel real it's gonna feel like you are immersed in the world that you are um, living and experiencing real life and perhaps Sydney's going one step further because he's saying look poets can add a normative addition to what should or shouldn't be happening so instead of just saying this is what happened they can say this is what happened and this is how it should have happened or this is how it shouldn't have happened and it can have this normative stance have this moral stance it can have this um you know, spiritual stance. This is what should or shouldn't have happened. Didactic, right? Yeah, right. Um, and so, like, whereas historians, if you start to do that, you're just going into poetry's territory. You're not doing history anymore. Yeah. History is this dry, objective thing, right? Um, and philosophy, same thing. It's this dry, objective thing. As soon as you start going into metaphors and, and that sort of stuff, it's, boom, you're into poetry's land. And well, it's because you're going there because poetry is better at teaching people. And so, when he's saying poetry here, folks, he means fiction. He means telling stories. Whether it's through very literally actual verse, or through drama, or through what we would now call a novel or a short story, which they didn't back then. Yeah, they expect more stuff like, they'd be reading more epic poem, Beowulf right. kind of stuff, you know, and which, so, or even the Homer and Iliad, which is in that long form, right. or, you know, long... Uh, you By know, the way, Sidney wrote a novel, and John D. wrote a novel. Um, um, sorry, not John D. John Lilly. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, who knows about John D. But, uh... <laughs> uh John Lilly's supposed to be maybe the first writer of the English novel, and it's coming right around when Sydney's maybe writing Arcadia and that kind of stuff. Um, and you know, of his, you know. Oh, I mix it up with other titles of his. I wish I, I'll look that up later in our video. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't believe it's in Demi, and I believe that's a play. Oh, okay. Um. 
Yeah. So he begins kind of talking about some historical exam uh, examples, specifically here, you know, Xenophon and Cyrus. But I like this one little thing here that he has to say. Uh, it's like the next page over from what we just read. He says, Now, to that which is commonly attributed to the praise of history in respect of the notable learning is gotten by marking the success as though therein a man should see virtue exalted and vice punished. Truly that commendation is peculiar to poetry and far off from history. For, indeed, poetry ever sets virtue so out in her best colors, making fortune her well-waiting handmaid, that one must needs be enamored of her. Well, may you see. Um, Ulysses in a storm and in other hard plights. But they are but few exercises of patience and mag uh, mag magnanimity, to make them shine the more in the near falling prosperity. And of the contrary part, if evil men come to the stage, they ever go out, as the tragedy writer answered to no one that misliked the show of such persons. So manacled as they little animate folks to follow them. But the historian, being captivated to the truth of a foolish world, is many times a terror from well-doing, an encouragement to unbridled wickedness. I like that line, being captived to the truth of a foolish world. Mm. Um, and also earlier when you say well may you see Ulysses in a storm yeah well may Philip see Ulysses in a storm he sees Ulysses everywhere he's bringing up Ulysses all the time like in this essay Ulysses this Ulysses that you can see him on like every other page and uh, Ulysses you know, and Horus I, I've seen a lot remember Ulysses is the guy that goes off to war and uh, his lover Penelope is oh, back yeah. at home we waiting for him we talked about this in the last yeah. episode right so yeah, yeah go watch part one if you haven't already but um, and so, yeah, he's just going to ramble off a bunch of examples here, but, you know, the so many examples he's got, which is sort of a mark of, you know, yeah. a lot to draw from. You know? Yeah, he's um, got a storehouse. Yeah, so he says, For do we not valiant uh, Mil Miltiades rot in his fetters? The just Phocion and the accomplished so Socrates put to death like traitors? The cruel Severus life lived prosper prosper prosperously? <laughs> the excellent Severus miserably murdered? Scylla and Marius dying in their beds, Pompey and Cicero slain then, when they would have had thought exile a happiness? See we not virtuous Cato driven to kill himself, and rebel Caesar so advanced at his name yet, after 1600 years, last in the highest honor? And marked by even Caesar's own words of the forenamed uh, Scylla, who in that only did honestly to put down his dishonest, uh, dishonest tyranny, literus nesivit, he without a learning, he was without learning. As if want of learning caused him to do well. He meant it not by poetry, which, not content with early earthly plagues, devises new punishments in hell for tyrants, nor yet by philosophy, which teaches Occidentos essay that they are to be killed, but no doubt by skill in history, for that indeed you can aff uh, you can afford you Solipsis, Periander, Philaris, Dionysus, and know not how, or uh, and. And know not how many more of the same kennel that speed well enough in their abominable and just or usurp usurpation. So, a lot to unpack here. Uh, first of all, like, you know, as we showed in the Hinslow Diary, there's a lot of plays about Romans. Uh, whether we're talking about Shakespeare itself with Julius Caesar, which is totally in the Hinslow Diary. Or, uh, you know, Titus... Pompey and Caesar is literally one of the Henslow Diary titles, yep. not yep. just Caesar, right? And, yeah, by the way, Cicero and Cato are sort of main characters and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, like, also I want to point out that there's, there's something, like, horribly chaotic about history. There's something, like... Like horribly dark and Ragnarok-y and and so yeah, it's that sort of uh, the, you know history written by the victors or uh, you know you obviously yeah it's already happened you can't touch you know what the what has sort of come before um, and yeah and what he's saying here is yeah having to look back and be like oh man look at all these you know we have these great men but oftentimes they're, they're sort of bad men and so they're not remembered for like happy go lucky stuff it's right for so and sort of, we're either you know, getting or, warped history or right. even if we do get the actual dry history like what's to be gleaned from that it's just it's just this cynical um nihilistic world that we live in if you want to glean meaning from history uh you're not it's not going to paint a good picture for the world and you know, maybe that is the truth, but also at some point, like, 
we don't have to go writing about it every day and, and recapitulating it. We need to capitulate something that will take us out of that truth and towards something greater. This is like, you know, in, in a very indirect way, this is him saying poetry, fiction, it's a way to lead us out of this horrible human history that we have where horrible psychopathic people get get to live and the, yeah, and the, and the, and the just people yeah, you know, killing themselves yeah, or rotting in jail yeah, or whatever, right? Get, getting mauled. Socrates, and, yeah, yeah, getting poisoned. Yeah, yeah. Horrible stuff. Only the good die young. Yeah, <laughs> and like um, th there's a real like almost Marlovian outlook to the world when you you know sort of pick it apart and look at it like that that like you know that anybody that tries to do something worthwhile is going to get shot down and that anybody that is doing something that does get remembered is this horrible corrupt evil thing and um yeah it's not that's not just shakespearean that's that's downright marlovian um yeah. It's, yeah, it's the sort of bleak view or quote unquote realization of like the will to power. So yeah, to speak, it's Tamburlaine right? in uh, a nutshell, yeah, right? Yeah, like might go. makes right. Right. Yeah. Right, yes. Yeah. Um, and once again, it might make sense if you're the guy that's hanging out with Giordano Bruno. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, space is infinite and it's endless. And yeah, yeah just and, a speck or, and that like it's um, all. Uh, it's all uh, sound and Fury, maybe. <laughs> well, as Six Days Theater's pointing out that um, Bruno writes a text um, on bond, of Bonds in general, and that that is, like, in, in many ways comparable to Machiavelli's The Prince. Like, that's... Like, Machiavelli's The Prince is so much about political manipulation and how to be this perfect, like, you know, courtier-type dude that can, um, you know manipulate people against each other but um bruno's is like one step further and more abstracted just like in general what kinds of things can you get people to think or say to manipulate them uh, what kind of things can you do or say to manipulate them and uh yeah like it, at some point sydney might have the super cynical outlook on the world if if he and his buddies are like fully aware of that capability you know so yeah i don't know just to get back to some of the i've alluded to like the mk ultra um implications or i don't know like can, uh, i don't know this yeah it's just, predictive just, programming right just, yeah it, it, it's just like really enhanced psychology right and so right. this is all yeah what, what that sounds like to me honestly mk like, stands for mind like control really well yeah. you know like, yeah <laughs> yeah like on on a on a grand scale, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you're into that, also read Phillips. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have set this out from episode one that yeah, this definitely has to do with like empire and kind of control. So it's yeah, I always have to yeah be in awe on some of this stuff, but I'm also sort of like at odds with it at the same time. Yeah, like um, it, when you get on a roller coaster, you're doing it to have fun, but like know that it does kill people like like uh i almost flew off a roller coaster at six flags astro world which no longer exists um sh i was there the last day it closed with your brother and oh, your dad oh. yeah. where was i <laughs> you were a sophomore in high school i'm in oh, eighth grade playing soccer yeah there you go doing nothing but playing soccer that year um but yeah, at any rate, like I almost flew off one of the roller coasters because the bar only went down this far. My dad grabbed me by my calf oh my and God. like, yeah, I was all the way out, and he, you, you know, yanked me back into this world, and <laughs> and um, like the next year they closed it down. It became Serial Thriller, which was the the big you know ride where he, it was way nicer and way cooler. But before that, the ride that I almost flew off of was called Excalibur. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So there you go. Yeah, Scalper is uh, definitely a way cooler name. Yeah. Right? Um, which the reason that closed down is some other kid did fly out because oh, he had a dad with way slower reflexes. <laughs> yeah, my dad was oh, an athlete. Be laugh laughing at that. <laughs> he, I think he lived. I think he broke his leg or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just imagine a high speed roller coaster accident. <laughs> like, all right. 
uh, moving on with uh, MK Sydney here. <laughs> Alright, so moving on here, we're just going to get Phillips hyping up the poet some more. But maybe also why, yeah, that, yeah, fiction just does have a little more bite um, than the philosopher does, or, because, yeah, the poetry can once again just dress up the philosopher's stuff, you know? Right. So. Oh, here, my bad. Real quick, uh, we had a commenter in one of our videos ask that we mention additions, so I'm going to make sure to do that here. Uh, all three of these copies are the same book, even though they got different sort of looks to them, but they're all the Oxford World's Classics, uh, Sir Philip Sidney, The Major Works, um, the editor is Catherine Duncan Jones, uh, her little intro on Sidney's really great, um, sorry, continue. So here we goes. For suppose it be granted, that which I suppose with great reason may be denied, that the philosopher, in respect of his method, uh, methyl, methyl, Methodological, method, method, meth no, methodical. methodical. God dang. <laughs> I'll start over. For suppose to be granted, that which I suppose with great reason may be denied, that the philosopher, in respect of his methodical proceeding, teach more perfectly than the poet. Yet do I think that no man is so much phil philo philosophos, a friend to the philosopher, as to compare the philosopher in moving with the poet. And that moving is of a higher degree than teaching. It may by this appear that it is well nigh both a cause and effect of teaching. For who will be taught if he be not moved with desire to be taught? Okay, yeah. Uh, as somebody that teaches kids that don't want to be at school, it's a useless task. Um, you have to trick them. <laughs> You don't have to trick them, but you have to get them to, to want... to MK Ultra them. I mean. <laughs> some, some of them, yes. Uh, you gotta get the, the Kubrick machine, you know. <laughs> Clockwork orange them, but... Uh, um, no, most of them, you, you just have to get them interested in some way. Like, it's, it's, people have to be interested in something to want to learn something. And no... Not many people are interested in just having dry, dense philosophy poured out at them. Similarly, not many are, not as many are into dry dense history poured out at them. Like, how can you get them to be interested in all that subject matter? You gotta, you gotta get a gateway. And what's maybe a perfect gateway? Storytelling. You know. Yep. And yeah, uh, and yeah, to get them to move, like he says, yeah. So he's like, poetry is of a higher degree than teaching. And then he says. And what so much good doth that teaching bring forth? I speak still of a moral doctrine, as that it moves one to do that which is doth teach. For as Aristotle says, it is not gnosis, knowing, but praxis, doing, must be the fruit. And how praxis cannot be without being moved to practice, it is no hard matter to consider. The philosopher shows you the way, he informs you of the particularities, as well of the tediousness of the way as of the pleasant lodging you shall have when your journey is ended, as of the many by turnings that may divert you from your way. But this is to no man but to him that will read him, and read him with attentive, studious painfulness, which constant desire whoever so has in him has already passed half the hardness of the way, and therefore is beholden to the philosopher for but the other half. Nay, truly, learned men have learnedly thought that there was once where, that where once reason has so much overmastered passion is that the mind has a free desire to do well. The inward light each mind has in of itself as good as a philosopher's book, since in nature we know it is well to do well, and what is well and what is evil, although not in the words of art which philosophers bestow upon us. For of our natural conceit the philosophers drew it, but to be moved to do that which we know, or to be moved with desire to know, hoc opus hic, iber, uh, hic labor est. This is the work, this is the labor, or this is the hard part. So, uh, this this whole idea that romantic poets are the, the dawn of the individual mind, um, that romantic poets are, are the ones that, like, that said... To heck with enlightenment and all its logic. We we need to reach to our inner inner selves. Like, well, that was supposed to be like 
late 1700s, early 1800s, the whole romantic movement is this, like, you know, casting away from this real logical, you know... Rational, maybe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Philip Sidney's doing it here 200 plus years, you know, b before. Um, and as Harold Bloom will say, well, it's because Shakespeare invents this whole idea. This, this whole inward looking. It, Shakespeare's the one that says we got to look inward and put ourselves on the page that we have to not just be logical and say first this then this then this uh we have to put multiplicity and ambiguities and add all the psychology well i guess harold bloom has never read philip sydney like i i guess he just never read philip he didn't get that far uh, even though harold bloom famously said that he read every important piece of literature that there ever was <laughs> Uh, I guess because he's already figured out what's important to make a list. I don't know how you do that. Um, but uh, it, at any rate... I'm not sure how a man who claims, as we read in one of those earlier episodes, a man who claims to be like a Gnostic Kabbalist or whatever, it's like, how do you like know those terms and then like know anything to do with this history period and not, like, be of the mind that Shakespeare didn't write this stuff. Yeah. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> well, I mean, he, I mean, Harold Bloom does, like, at some point acknowledge his own cognitive dissonance, doesn't he? Like, pretty much, I he, think. He does say that, like, it's gotta be Shakespeare, because that's how history works, but he also says that, like, there's no way to understand how it could be Shakespeare. Yeah. Like, that's totally this miraculous, anomalous, like, religious type event that, like, somehow this one guy was endowed with this superhuman capacity for knowledge and like you know somehow he heard the whistling in the wind and like picked up on how you know like medical knowledge worked or like you know he looked in the reflection of the water and he figured out how legal knowledge worked or i think that's called demons <laughs> like, if i'm correct hey, <laughs> hey um or a faustian bargain may i say yeah. All right, continuing on here. So now, now they're in of all sciences. I speak still of human, and according to the human conceit is our poet the monarch, for he doth not only show the way, but he gives so sweet a prospect into the way as will entice any man to enter it. Nay, he doth as if your journey should lie through a fair vineyard, at the very first, give you a cluster of grapes that full of taste you may long to pass further. He begins not with obscure definitions, which may blur the margin with interpretations, and load the memory with doubtfulness. But he comes to you with words set in delightful proportion, either accompanied with, or prepared for, the well-enchanting skill of music. And with a tale, forsooth, he comes unto you, with a tale which holds children from play, and old men from the chimney corner, and, pretending no more, doth intend the winning of the mind from wickedness to virtue, even as the child is often brought to take most wholesome things, by hiding them in such other as to have a pleasant taste, which, if one should begin to tell them the nature of the aloes or rhubarb they should receive, would sooner take their phys physic at their ears than at their mouth. So it is in men, most of which are childish in the best things, till they can be cradled in their graves, glad they will be to hear the tales of Hercules, Achilles, C Cyrus, Aeneas, and hearing them must need must and hearing them must needs hear the right description of wisdom, valor, and justice, which, if they had been barely, that is to say, philosophically set out, they would swear they'd be brought to school again. Yep, and it's like in a nutshell, uh, they were not going to be receptive to it had it been given to them in a philosophical treatise, but as soon as a, you know, commendable poet is able to put it in a certain story structure with a certain versification with rhymes or um, figurative language or anything like that, uh, all of a sudden, hey, this, this is a neat little story. Uh, I'm going to quit working. I'm going to hear the story. And by the end of it, you're talking about all these themes that would have been given to you in a philosophical treatise. All right, and so the very next paragraph, he continues, and this is a very important line that I love a lot. Um, 
That imitation whereof poetry is, has the most conveniency to nature of all other, insomuch that, as Aristotle says, those things which in themselves are horrible, as cruel battles, unnatural monsters, are made in poetical imitation delightful. Truly I have known men that even with reading uh, Amadis de Gaulle, which, God knows, wants much of perfect poesy, <laughs> have found their hearts moved to the exercise of courtesy, liberality, and especially courage. Who reads Anus carrying old An uh, Anki's on his back that wishes not if it were his fortune to perform so excellent an act? Whom do not those words of Turnus move, the tale of Turnus having planted his image in the imagination? Um, I can't pronounce that, but what he said, he says, Shall this land see him in flight? Is it so wretched to die? And this is one of these supposed, you know, really awesome moments, you know, it's, you know, the, uh, the holdout of the rebels, and, you know, they can either flee, maybe get away with their lives, or, hey, no, we need to plant our feet here, we need to make yeah. a stand, you know, yeah. sort of, last stand. yeah, yeah we're Mel Spartans Gibson. or whatever, yeah. right, yeah, but this is, uh, <laughs> I think what he's referring to, this is actually a recent, uh, like, Spanish work, and maybe that's also what he's referred to up here, but there is something, uh, I, what he's, this line is from some contemporary Spanish proto-novel, and you know it's you know some heroic moment for now for the whole Spanish kingdom to sort of rally around against yeah. and sort of uh, you know kind of have this for lack of a better word a meme yeah. that Philip Sidney has already referenced yeah. in in this particular a patriotic meme um, yeah. yeah has already referenced in this essay so yeah go watch part one where he he literally talks about yeah memetics yeah um, and this is literally what he's saying is like dude like aren't or don't you kind of get some shiver down your spine when you kind of hear all these lines and yeah, say, don't like, you want that in our own tongue, essentially? I mean, yeah. I guess most of our viewers are old enough to be familiar with Saving Private Ryan, with the opening scene where they're storming Normandy. Okay. Um, like, a yeah, when they're, when they're storming Normandy, like, would you actually want to have ever been there? No. No, like, in very literal, real quality, would you have ever wanted to be there? Like, no, you'd get your head split open with shrapnel and that's yeah, it. Yeah, you'd be the dude that, yeah, just had yeah. some, like, very nonchalant death. That yeah, had, yeah. Very, uh, <laughs> abrupt and Yeah, a mile before you even got to the coast. Anti-climatic, like, yeah, yeah. Like, um, but when you watch that movie, you're captivated by the the thrill of danger the sense of getting to rise yeah, to be the, the brave, brave one the brave actions and yeah. yeah the helping out the maybe comrade. i could be like that main character that didn't get mutilated by <laughs> shrapnel like for whatever reason maybe i could be that guy and um that's what aristotle and philip sydney are well, saying I'm Tom here Hanks, that, like, so i know i'll be okay <laughs> oh wait nope never mind <laughs> <laughs> yeah. matt damon you yeah. want to be matt damon. yeah <laughs> um but Aristotle's saying, like, yeah, you don't actually want to be Tom Hanks. He dies. Like, but you do somehow through the telling of it. And so poetry has this extra... You could have Matt Damon at your grave. It has this extra... <laughs> yeah. Like, if you just hear it in, in a historical sense, you don't want to be Tom Hanks. But when you see it in this poetical rendering that is Spielberg's movie, all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I totally want to be Tom Hanks. And I want to lead these guys into battle. Like, like even Tom Hanks doesn't want to be Tom Hanks in that movie. Yeah, yeah. His character's like, I don't want to do this. But somehow, that movie, very patriotically, gets you into the sense of like, well, nobody wants to do this, but that's why we got to do it. And it's like, what? Why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but that's this phenomenon that they're getting at. Here. Yeah. Once again, yeah, unfortunately, you have to remember that probably the people that are reading this are, yeah, for the upper class people. So he's like, yeah, here's here's what I learned from my studies, everyone. Like, <laughs> And uh, I have more on, remember we already said that he's drawing, we already said that he's drawing obviously on this wealth of knowledge. And maybe I'll have a, a, a quote that I'll show you here later for a teaser for a future episode. But it's just, man, Philip Sidney, man, just you know, reading these certain lines here. Um, so yeah, not questioning him as a Shakespeare candidate is just still, still, still astounds me. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> it's it's. I mean, it's just because the death date, right? 
All right, so continuing on to the next page here, and we're going to kind of get into some more of these memes here that I'm talking about. And he says, By these, therefore, examples and reasons, I think it may be manifest that the poet, with the same hand of delight, doth draw the mind more effectually than any other ought doth. And so a conclusion not unfitly ensues, that as virtue is the most excellent resting place for all worldly learning to make his end of, so poetry, being the most familiar to teach it, and most princely to move towards it, in the most excellent work is the most excellent work men. But I am content not only to decipher him by his works, although works in commendation or dispraise must ever hold a high authority, but more narrowly will examine his parts so that, as in man, though altogether may carry a presence full of majesty and beauty, perchance in some defectious piece we may find a blemish. Now in his parts, kinds, or species, as you list to term them, it is to be noted that some posies have coupled together two or three kinds, as tragical and comical, whereupon is risen the tragic comical. Some, in the like manner, have mingled prose and verse, as San Azaro and uh, Bathius. Some have mingled matters heroical and pastoral. But that comes to all one in this question, for if severed they be good, the conjunction cannot be hurtful. Therefore, perchance, forgetting some, and leaving some as needless to be remembered, it shall not be amiss in a word to cite the special kinds, to see what faults may be found in the right use of them. Hmm. Is it then the pastoral poem which is misliked? For perchance, where the hedge is lowest, they will soon sleep over. Is the poor pipe disdain, <laughs> which sometimes comes out of Melibosius' mouth, can show the misery of people under hard lords and ravening soldiers, and again, by Titerius, uh, who is with what blessedness is derived to them that lie lowest from the goodness of them that sit highest sometimes under the prettiest tales of wolves and sheeps can include the whole considerations of wrongdoing and patience sometimes show that contention for trifles can get but a trifling victory where perchance a man may see that even alexander and darius when they strove who should be the cock of his world's dunghill the <laughs> benefit they got was the ever laughters that the ever livers may say I remember such things, and that the defeated Thrissus struggled vainly. For that time, with us, Corridon is the Corridon. Or is the lamenting Egaliac, which in kind heart which would move rather pity than blame, who would bewails with the great philosopher Heraclitus, the weakness of mankind and the wretchedness of the world, who is surely to be praised either for compassionate accompanying just causes of lamentation, or for rightly painting how weak be the passion of wolfulness. Is the bitter and wholesome iambic who rubs the galled mind, and making shame the trumpet of villainy with bold and open crying against naughtiness, or the satiric who, the sly fellow touches every vice while making his friend, who sportingly never leaves till he makes a man laugh at folly, and at length ashamed to laugh at himself, which he cannot avoid without avoiding the folly, who, while circum precordia ludit, he plays around his heartstrings, gives us to feel how many headaches a passionate life brings to us, how when all is done, if we do not lack the equable te temperament, it is an elubre, uh, est elubre animus sinos non deficit aquos. Um, no, perchance it is the comic whom naughty playmakers and stagekeepers have justly made odious. Um, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to stop right here because if you're looking at the text here, it's like him just going like rapid fire. Like, yeah. it's like this and this, that. It's like this and that. And yeah, so he's, you know, like, you know, like and this, like that. So um, he's, he's trying to get it like, well, if people don't like poetry, like if, if there's this like stance against poetry, what particular part of poetry is it that people don't like? What, what is it that all these Puritans and folks like Stephen Gosson are, like, getting at? Why, why is it that they're taking down poetry? Well, let's look at each genre, because it's probably a specific genre. Like, when, when uh, parents in the 80s and 90s and 2000s were getting mad at the music industry... Were they getting mad at every genre of music? No, it's it's the the, the hip hop. It's it's the the punk rock, right? Um, and so surely there must be something like that going on here, because he says like, look, uh, it's definitely not the pastoral poem. Like pastoral poems, great. Everybody loves pastoral poems. Um, maybe it's it's got to be the elegiac and like. No, actually, no, that's fantastic. Um, everybody loves the elegiac. It's got to be the comic. I bet it's the comic. That's the reason. It's, 
It's got to be the comic here. Yeah, but once again, yeah, how he's just quoting, like, you know, he's just like, is it because of this, you know, quotes, quotes, you know, is it because of this, quote, 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 you know, once again, it's still just, right. yeah. Like, the, uh, he's not even answering these, he's, like, setting up these rhetorical questions not for himself to answer, but for him to sample classical authors who have already answered these questions. And uh, for people that are familiar with our work already, remember, uh, I don't know if you wanted to also stop us on that Corridon. Yep. Uh, line there. Who is uh, who has came? Who has claimed the name Corridon? Yeah, that, that's Edward Dyer. Edward Dyer, right? Yeah. Is that in the group theory wins video? Yes. To the arguments of abuse, I will answer after. Only this much now is to be said: that the comedy is an imitation of the common errors of our life, which he, the poet, represents in the most ridiculous and scornful sort that may be so as it is impossible that any beholder can be content to be such a one um what does it say there imitation of the common errors of see, our yeah, life comedy or only then so much to be said that the comedy itself should be an imitation of the common errors of our life it's almost like He's saying if, if you want to write a poem, or sorry, if you want to write a play and you're going to write a comedy, you know, it should be about errors. And so Shakespeare, after he picked up his errors guidebook for writing fiction for dummies, <laughs> first comedy he wrote, boom, comedy of errors. And, you know, um, I, I believe if, if you actually look up the chronology of Shakespeare's plays... What is the very first play that's listed as a comedy? At least by orthodox chronologies. Yeah, it's not Taming of a Shrew, right? Right. Maybe comedy of Errors. Comedy of Errors. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that was his first one that he wrote after picking up the guidebook for dummies. Yeah, that, that was the first one he picked up after... Uh, first one he wrote after picking up this guidebook for dummies. Um... <laughs> And uh, so let's see if he goes any anywhere else from this. So, and once again, he's saying, like, the whole point of comedies is to render something so absurd so that you, the viewer or reader, you totally understand that that's... N I don't want to be that person. I'm laughing out of the sense of superiority because I know I'm not that person and I will continue to not be that person. Um, it's almost this, like, heed, this warning, like, don't... Don't ever be this guy. Don't don't be this person. Um, now, as in geometry, the oblique must be known as well as the right, and in arithmetic, the odd as well as the even. So, in the actions of our life, who seeth not the filthiness of evil, wanteth a great foil to perceive the beauty of virtue. And so, not all, only is it this cautionary tale of like, don't do that, uh, don't don't be this guy. It's also this way to like appreciate your your place appreciate oh man i'm not i'm not getting crapped on by a giant horse or something like i don't th <laughs> i don't think that's in shakespeare guys uh, i'm i'm not shakespeare uh, that may be a philip sydney yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's in either but, but um yeah it's like you all of a sudden you appreciate where you're at um and like maybe that's even doubly so, if you're some commoner getting to watch someone like King Richard be brought to this low estate, and, like, you know, maybe that's not an exactly comic moment, but, like, to to be able to point and laugh and say, ha, I'm not that person. Mm -hmm. um, that must be so cathartic for someone to be a commoner at that time to see that happen to someone above you. You know, not just see somebody that's clearly below you, but see somebody above you get brought to this moment where they're below you um, in some form or fashion. But yeah, I also just like the mention obviously, you know, the mentioning of geometry. He's mentioned proportion mm -hmm. many multiple yep. times and that has just this weighty significance to um, you know, a lot of this hermetic thought and, you know, golden ratio and how it's supposed to be part of this Vitruvian sacred architecture sort of philosophy, I suppose, and whatnot. And if you're into the sort of, you know, cryptography and shapes and stuff and all the printings, then you yeah. know, this is still on that same, right. same He's tangent. Right, he's definitely 
thinking along those lines using that kind of language um this doth the comedy handle so in our private and domestical matters as with hearing it we get as it were in experience what it is to be looked for of a niggardly demia or a crafty davis or of a flattering natho of a vainglorious thrasso and not only to know what effects are to be expected but to know who be such by the signifying badge given them by the comedian and little reason hath any man to say that men learn the evil by seeing it so set out since as i said before there is no man living but by the force truth hath in nature no sooner seeth these men play their parts but wishes them in pistrinum although perchance the sack of his own faults lies so hidden behind his back that he seeth not himself dance the same measure whereto yet nothing can more open his eyes than to find his own actions contemptibly set forth and so it's also got this like didactical sort of ability yep. like yeah it may be for a lot of us to laugh at but it may also for you know we're laughing at it because we're like oh we'll never be that person but the person that is that person may be laughing at it because they're like oh yeah i totally do that i totally do that but if you shove that hard enough they oh i yeah. i do that i could end up like yeah the uh, i gotta the quit fool on the stage i right? gotta quit being that guy yep and um so that the right use of comedy will i think by nobody be blamed and much less of the high and excellent tragedy that openeth the greatest wounds and showeth forth the ulcers that are covered with tissue that maketh kings fear to be tyrants and tyrants manifest their tyrannical humors that with the steering the effects of admiration and commiseration teaches the uncertainty of this world and upon how weak foundations gilded roofs are built that maketh us know qui septa sevas dero imperio regit timet timentes metus in actorum redit which means uh, the savage king who wields the scepter with cruel sway um, dreads yeah, for fears though who fear him dread comes back to the head of the originator interesting yeah, yeah. Um, and like remember Shakespeare's supposed to be around this guy or the Earl of Essex there's supposed to be some relationship between really? I didn't know that. between well not Shakespeare but, oh but yeah you know the the writer shakespeare right oh, okay, like okay. uh right. Who, like whoever's writing richard the second is clearly super keyed into what is happening in the essex circle right uh, and it's not just that one hamlet twilis and Cressida, um any of those surrounding you know the, a five-year radius of the the essex you know rebellion um you can make those kinds of readings in not just shakespeare you can do it in johnson and others too but you can specifically do it in some big Shakespeare ones. And, like, what is Essex doing? What was his whole point? Like, what was the whole point of the Essex Rebellion? And maybe we need to do a video on that. But, like, at some point, it was to take down the tyrant queen. To maybe make a more equitable ruler or a more democratic ruler. They wouldn't use those terms back then. But a less tyrannical ruler. And, um... Like, Philip Sidney's showing that, like, clearly all about that. That, in conclusion, for all these different genres, like, comedy and tragedy are the the best. And they're the best because they help do these things. They keep a ruler from becoming a tyrant. And if a ruler is already a tyrant, it shows their tyrannical ways much more manifestly. Um, that's what our great art's supposed to be. That's why I like shows like South Park, right? Um, and uh, the tyrant doesn't necessarily always have to be the head of the political state either the tyrant can be whoever is the wielder of power whether that's someone like the secretary of state like William or Robert Cecil or the tyrant being the leviathan the mob itself the the political mass of people if if they can all wield themselves to be a tyrant like say during some of the English civil wars you know, um, and so ultimately, comedies and tragedies 
can literally help you keep a stable union on your nation state. Like, what? Okay. All right. So any of you folks out there trying to argue that Oxford is getting that annuity from Queen Elizabeth to help put out pro-Tudor state propaganda, like, surely Oxford's got to be talking to Sydney a little bit about some of these things. Maybe Sydney has a hand in some of that as well. Um, and, of course, it's interesting that an annuity, what year does that annuity get to Oxford? Drum roll. 1586. 1586. And so if... The true Shakespeare episode. Yeah, if, if Philip Sidney is having to fake his death and live after that, I don't know why Oxford would be his money handler. It, it's a wild, a wild, wacky theory, but, um, you know, there are several people that get those annuities. It's not just Oxford, and it's not just an 86, but perhaps this is a wild, wacky theory I had. It's a non-disclosure agreement. It's an NDA. You get this annuity every year so long as you keep your trap shut about this guy being dead. Wild, wacky theory, I know, but... Um, Feathers ruffled? Maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, th we have we have so little evidence as to what the annuity could possibly be about. It, it's just like a one-line thing. He, get, he gets this annuity and it, like... Who else gets the annuity? Doesn't like Cecil and Walsingham or something? Um, Robert Cecil does at some point. I don't know if that's exactly in 1586 or not. Um, Francis Walsingham does as well, senior, uh, Sir right. Francis Walsingham. Um, and this, this is all going off of B Bonner Cutting, who was suggested to us for her Venus and Adonis video, which I still haven't been able to get around or find, actually. Uh, but I've watched several of her other videos, and one of them's about her, uh, about the annuity, um, the thousand pound annuity that Oxford's supposed to get every year from Queen Elizabeth. And she goes and she finds that this annuity document is are there any others like it oh well there are and uh, they seem to be almost secret service type documents and so this is some sort of secret service fund and uh, this is at a time when they're supposed to be kind of hurting financially so how are they able to fund this sort of black budget stuff going on why would they do it more importantly and um, so if it is state-run propaganda it may be that this essay is super influential in that thought. And remember, Philip Sidney is totally the guy that will write a letter or write an essay to convince somebody of something, even if it's the Queen. So skipping over to the next page in our copies, uh, I'm going to begin here, and it's just a little one that I'm going to highlight, but he says, In Hungary, I have seen it in all manner of feasts, and of other such meetings, to have songs of their ancestors' valor, which that right soldier-like nation think the chiefest kindlers of brave courage. The incomparable Lacedaemonians did not only carry that kind of music ever with them to the field, but even at home, as such songs were made so that they were all content to be singers of them. When the lusty men were to tell what they did, the old men what they had done, and the young men what they should do. And, um, so... I'll just finish this whole thing here, and then we'll talk. And where a man may say that Pindar many times praises highly victories of small moment, matters rather of sport than virtue, as it may be answered, it was the fault of the poet, and not of the poetry. So indeed, the chief fault was in the time and custom of the Greeks, who set those toys at so high a, play, uh, so high a price that Philip, of Macedon reckoned a horse race won at Olympus among his three fearful felicities. But as unimitable Pindar often did, so it is that kind most capable and most fit to awake the thoughts from the sleep of idleness to embrace honorable enterprises. Um, so yeah, I just like how he's relating his experience being in Hungary here and just saying, look, when we are at this big banquets and things, everyone's everyone knows the same tune. They're all on the same page about right. all the little God bless America or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and that you know most you know that sort of uh, nationalistic uh, like yeah. just likened in the Save It Private Private Ryan um, uh, analogy there. Uh, the same thing where he is yeah longing for a national identity essentially, right? Yeah, he wants. 
every Englishman to be able to know, you know, God save the queen or, you know, whatever it is. I don't know the appropriate English songs, but essentially yeah. the same, the same caliber. Yeah. A social cohesion. Deep in the heart of Texas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why we have to sing that at every sport. You event. and I both know it though. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure why. But of course, I like how he also brings up Philip of Macedon, yep. who is the father of Alexander the Great, who's already he's already likened to, and then of course his dad's name is Philip. So, well, and um, Philip's father is named Henry Amintas. Wait, Philip's father? Yeah, Philip. Sorry, Philip of Macedon. Oh, oh okay, okay. Uh, oh, wait. I remember so. Dyer says that Corridon is Amentos, right? Uh, maybe. Right? Isn't that how? He, isn't that what he said that he was? He's uh, like writing his Amentos. He's like, oh, I'm also Corridon or something. No, he was writing his Nicholas Breton. Oh. Okay, um, okay. But um, yeah, Thomas Watson uses the nickname Amentos, and Spencer scholars say Amentos refers to Ferdinando Stanley. And uh, at some point, yeah, we're getting all these weird Greco-Roman nicknames being cycled around and there's something there um but yeah if you ever read a play and there's a mention of alexander the great that's probably a philip sydney reference um like in the uh opening of sejanus like that's definitely a philip sydney reference when they're talking about alexander or in uh, samuel daniels um so i think musophilus um yeah, references Alexander. That's a reference to Philip Sidney. So just at the bottom of this page here, he'll continue. But if anything be already said in the defense of sweet poetry, all concurs to the maintaining the heroical, which is not only a kind, but the best and most accomplished kind of poetry. For, as the image of each action stirs and instructs the mind, so the lofty image of such worthies most inflames the mind with desire to be worthy, and informs with counsel how to be worthy. So literally, exactly, just like the Saving Private yeah. Ryan thing. Here's how you be brave. It's in interesting because you know insanity. <laughs> I don't think Sidney um, writes much he heroical poetry. Like he's sitting here saying it's it's the best kind, but like he didn't really write much. Uh, you know, Spencer wrote some. Drayton wrote a bunch. Um, Sidney, I don't think he really does. Um, but that said, if he himself is the poem, in a sense, like, if, if he martyrs himself to become Samuel Daniel and fakes his death for whatever reason, maybe this might be some of the reason behind it, his Philip Sidney character gets to be this heroical... Uh, yeah, a stand-in. A yeah. sort of real-life representation. Like, oh yeah. man, like, here's a guy who went out and died for us, and oh man, he took off his armor. He was like, one of us? Like, yeah, he gave his water bottle and all of that. <laughs> like, he said he could have, we could have his girlfriend. Yeah, like... <laughs> which Oxford took literally. <laughs> um, Only let... Aeneas be worn in the tablet of your memory, how he governs himself in the ruin of his country, in the preserving his old father, and carrying away his religious ceremonies, in obeying the gods' commandment to leave Dido, though not only all passions kindness, but even the human consideration of virtuous gratefulness, would have craved other of him, how in storms, how in... Did it say storms twice? How in storms, how in storms... How in sports, how in war, how in peace, how a fugitive, how victorious, how besieged, how besieging, how to strangers, how to allies, how to enemies, how to his own. Lastly, how in his inward self, and how in his outward government, and I think, in a mind most prejudiced with a prejudicating humor, he'll be found in excellently, excellency fruitful. Yet, even as Horace says, Melis Crips... Uh, Crisipso and uh, et Cantor, better than Crisipsis and Cantor. But truly, I imagine it falls out with these po poet worshippers, wor worshippers as whippers. Was, oh yeah, but I truly imagine it falls out with these poet whippers, as with some good women who often are sick, but in faith they cannot tell where. So the name of poetry is odious to them, but neither his cause nor effects, neither the sum that contains him nor the particularities descending from him. 
give any fast handle to their carping disprays. Um, so they're haters. <laughs> but I like this whole line here where he's talking about once again, yeah, it's a yeah, heroical is pretty great. But you know, here's and he was also saying like you know this teaches you how to be worthy and heroic and cool or whatever. But you know, don't forget Aeneas here where it's saying you know how to also be you know. Uh, virtuously grateful when you know your country's in ruin and you know you're yeah. you, to bring Tom Hanks back again you know, or, you know you're, you're cast away and you yeah. know, so I will at least I have my life or whatever have you um, but then but yeah you know, he just but he starts to rattle off you know not only these two instances but how to be when you're in a storm or how to be when you're in a, you know a high high stakes sport or how to be when you're in war or when you're being besieged or maybe when you're doing the besieging um, and of course obviously the like, lastly, how in his inward self, you know, how you government your or your own outward, how do you appear outwardly to other right. people, your outward government, like, dude, like, that's some real cerebral stuff that he's, it's all Shakespearean stuff, is it not? Like, this exactly is exactly what Bloom says. Exactly but. like Bloom says. Um, and actually, this little quote that he has here from Horace, he just, he actually clipped it off at the end. Um, he's, you know, this is from a longer line, and the longer line, in the longer line, he uh, Horace says something about Homer, but he says, Homer tells us what is fair and what is foul. And um, I just like that little juxtaposition between that English translation. Double, 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 double. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Big uh, Beth. Uh, yeah, foul is fair and fair is foul. So it's a little flip on that. But if it's coming from a Horace translation, potentially, uh, yeah. you know. So earlier I, I said uh, he's basically calling these people haters. Um, you know, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but at the bottom of the page there, he says, First, truly I note not only in these mis misomusi poet haters, but in all that kind of people who seek a praise by dispraising others, that they do prodigally spend a great many wandering words and quips and scoffs, carping and taunting at each thing which, by staring the spleen, may stay the brain from a thorough beholding, sorry, a through beholding the worthiness of the subject. Um, maybe that uh, quip should remind you of uh, maybe some people. Uh, um, won't go too far well, into it. Well, let's keep but, going uh, yeah. while we're on it. Uh, we're going to go back to the previous, but let's finish this. I'll read it. Uh, those kind of objections as they are full of very idle easiness since there is nothing of so sacred a majesty but that an itching tongue may rub itself upon it so deserve they no other answer but instead of laughing at the jest to laugh at the jester <laughs> we know a playing wit can praise the discretion of an ass hmm. that the comfortableness of being in debt and the jolly commodity of being sick of the plague so of the contrary side, if we turn Ovid's verse, ut letiat virtuis proximati mali, that lie in good names of evil, Agrippa will be as merry in showing the vanity of science, as Erasmus was in commending of folly. Neither shall any man or matter escape some touch of these smiling railers. But, yeah, I feel like there's a lot to get into, but, but obviously the big standout line is here for me. We know... A playing wit can praise the discretion of an ass, the comfortableness of being in debt, and the jolly commodity of being sick of the plague. So yeah, I, I, people have said that, you know, have, we've already, in the first video, connected again this close reference between ox and ass, or maybe that was in, we were likened it to the, that's what they said in the uh, Troas and Cres, uh, Cressida, right? Right. Um, but this, yeah, who else was also like in big debt? Apparently, yeah, Oxford, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's and, anything here. Well, we in like playing wit to to you know better unpack it, it might require understanding what the tone is here, and um, yeah, that that's a little obscure. Is he said we know a plain wit can praise the discretion of an ass, the com comfortableness of being in debt, and jolly commodity of being sick of the plague. Like those all sound like absurdities, but at the same time, if you've ever been broke for a while, and like 
you know, trying to get a really good job to get you out of being broke, it's a hard thing to do. Whereas if you've been eking by being broke and you know how to eke by, a sense of comfort comes out of that. So there is truth to that statement. It's like, it's not just this pure, ridiculous comment, like, to be comfortable in debt. Oh, that's so silly. Like, no, like, there's a knowingness to it. And, um, probably the same with the discretion of an ass, like, not maybe not literally a donkey, but, like, um, that goes that's, into the Agrippan philosophy, yeah. which, who's the first one he names on the, like, next paragraph? Yeah. Oh, Agrippa. Um, and yeah, the jolly commodity of being sick of the plague. We should all totally appreciate that in a post-COVID world where everybody was so sick of dealing with all the COVID restrictions, dealing with the possibility of people getting sick um we were all kind of like over it and uh yeah there's a truth to it and so it's not just this silly line interesting and so like you know the the merriness and the telling of these ridiculousness is knowing as absurd as it sounds there's truth in it and um as absurd as it might be to say that science is vain there's truth to that um, to, you know, same with as absurd as it is to say that folly can be commended, there's truth to that. And so Sydney's like clearly praising people here who can find inversions. Um, and so maybe he's praising Oxford if Oxford is this, you know, plain wit. Um, if people think that Sydney knows who Shakespeare is and Thus is maybe making some pokes at the famous uh, famous victories of Henry V, um, which, you know, when it's, according to Oxfordian theory, when it's later put together as Henry V, um, it's responding to Sidney's criticisms of the earlier version. Um, but, like, a lot of people that make this Oxfordian argument want to say that Sidney out and out hates Oxford, but if that plain wit is the same one that he supposedly hates, then no, he's saying, look, it may look bad, and it may look absurd, but there's actually something to it. So. All right, so I skipped down here to uh, just uh, to the next paragraph, essentially. And so I'll start. But that which gives greatest scope to their scorning humor is rhyming and versing. It is already said, and as I think truly said, it is not rhyming and versing that makes posy. One may be a poet without versing, and a versifier without poetry, but yet presupp uh, presuppose it were inseparable, as indeed it seems Scaliger judges, truly it were inseparable commendation. For if a ratio next to ratio, speech next to reason, be the greatest gift bestowed upon morality, mortality, that cannot be praiseless with doth most polish the blessing of speech, which considers each word, not only as a man may say by his forcible quality, but by his best measured quantity, carrying even in themselves a harmony, without, perchance, number, measure, order, proportion, be in our time grown odious. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah, there he is saying, look, all these things that made uh, poetry great in previous times, it's, it's not happening in, in, in our time and place. We don't have all these beautiful amounts of numbers and measure and order and proportion uh, that say earlier Italians or Greco-Romans or French people may have been doing. And so like it, at some point this is a call to arms. Guys, we got to start doing this. Mm -hmm. If if you are going to go write an epic poem, you know, and try and get famous for it, you know, if your first epic poem and you're going to write it, William Shakespeare, whoever Shakespeare is, Got his dummy's guidebook, and it's like, oh, I'm going to write me a poem. What will I need to do? And it's like, all right, make sure that there's number, measure, order, and proportion. And Shakespeare took that and just went went to the moon and so that we get people like Alan Green finding, like, you know, the speed of light and the circumference of the earth by doing proportion between the, the numbers of the letters and the words. Like, um, yeah, it's because some guy that we don't know who he is that we call Shakespeare found this guidebook for dummies. Like it, it, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, but at some point, like, right there, there's a truth to that. Your sarcastic Shakespeare sound 
sounded exactly like when Robin Williams <laughs> did his impression of Shakespeare. Uh, so I just had to make note of that. That was funny. <laughs> but yes, exactly. Yes, uh, just. So Shakespearean, like, can I say it again? Um, but here, uh, if you didn't like that, I think this next paragraph has also got some yeah. good singers. But lay aside the just praise it has by being the only fit speech for music. Music, I say, the most divine striker of the senses. Thus much is undoubtedly true, that if reading be foolish without remembering, memory be only the true, being the only treasure of knowledge. Those words, words which are fittest for memory are likewise most convenient for knowledge. Now that verse far exceeds prose in the knitting of memory, the reason is manifest. The words, besides their delight, which has a great affinity to memory, being so set, as one cannot be, but, uh, cannot be lost, but the whole work fails, which, accusing itself, calls the remembrance back to itself, and so most strongly confirms it. Besides one word so, as it were, begetting another, as it be in rhyme or measured verse, by the former a man shall have a, have a near guess to the follower. Lastly, even though they have taught the art of memory, having showed at nothing so apt for it as a certain room divided into many places, well and thoroughly known, now that has, now that has the verse in effect perfectly, every word having his natural seat which seat must needs make the words remembered. But what needs more in a thing so well known to men? Who is it that was ever a scholar that doth carry away some verses of Virgil, Horace, or Cato, which in his youth he learned, and even to his old age served him for hourly lessons? As Latin stuff here, stray away from an inquisitive man, he is sure to be garrulous. While each pleases himself, we are a credulous mob. But the fittest it has for the memory is notably proven by all delivery of arts, wherein for the most part, from, uh, from grammar to logic, mathematic, physic, and the rest, the rules chiefly necessary to be borne away are compiled in verses. So that verse, being in its sweet self and orderly, and being best for memory, the only handle of knowledge, and it must be in jest that any man can speak against it. So, block to unpack there. Um, you know... For those of you that uh, that think he's he's being a little hyperbolic, that he's saying that you know poetry is the best way to remember everything. Yeah, we don't have it in our like guidebooks or like instruction manuals, but like when you learn basic skills in school, how do you do it? You do it through mnemonic devices. You do it through sing-alongs. Yeah, no, nobody tried. To, Twinkle, twinkle, lit, you know, the same yeah, like, song, but. no, nobody ever tried to learn the ABCs without that song. Like, all right, A, B, C, D. Like, try and get a kid to memorize the ABCs without the song. Like, it's almost inhuman. Like, uh, how how would how would you try and? It's twenty six different things in a complete sequence, and you have to get every one of them exactly right in the exact order every time. How do you do that without some mnemonic device? And, um, uh, yeah, honestly, a lot of them end up being kind of sing-songy, but I was even telling you before we were recording that I remember the quadratic equation from middle school because they had it to the, um, Pop Goes the Weasel, X uh, equals negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So there you go. Yeah. I, I didn't learn the song, and I <laughs> wouldn't have been able to tell you that, probably. I don't know. I, I You don't use it, you lose it. And Except if you've already remembered the song. Oh, one other thing here. That he mentions that this... Uh, the, he literally says the art of memory. Mm -hmm. Which is not only uh, a Peter Ramos thing, but I think we're going to get into eventually... Uh, Robert Flood, and that's where Francis Yates is talking about theater of the world here, mm. about um, and that maybe the Globe Theater is based on uh, these these memory sort of uh, exercises that this guy came up with. This Robert Flood guy is this British mathematician mm. philosopher dude. So yeah, he came up with uh, some of this. But also another big memory guy. 
uh, and he she was talking or I'm sorry she Sydney was talking about rooms and uh, uh, and how you know he literally said something about you know here we go here we go lastly even though they have uh, it, lastly even they that have taught the art of memory have showed nothing so apt for it as a certain room divided into many places so he's saying here that yo so these guys are coming up with all this stuff about you know the art of memory kind of like Peter Ramos kind of like rubber flood here and their their way of having their memory is not through you know little sing-songy mnemonics but creating all these memory rooms this memory palace and so you store all these information in these different memory rooms and have all these right. associations with it but Sydney's saying here like you know I think these this basic prose mnemonic stuff is or I'm sorry poetic mnemonic stuff is going to be way better than doing all this elaborate you know sort of right stuff or, or that just or at least even with it that it's yeah gonna, gonna yeah still rely on it to right yeah at some point like use the poetic mnemonic device on top of your memory room it's still better served like it's still this ultimate end all be all and it's like even that even if itself is like you're it's still sort of like a, a poetic exercise yeah in itself you've You've conceptualized, you've poeticized your memory bank as as a palace. You make which, some it's kind much of already done, you know. It's yeah, like, meaningful it's pattern that's somehow streamlined. Yeah, like yeah. Um, let me see. How much how much longer do you want to go with this one? So yeah, the last thing I want to just close it here. The, of the last part we uh, read, and then we'll we'll call it here for part two. But he says. Who is it that ever was a scholar that doth not carry away some verses of Virgil, Horace, or Cato, which in his youth he learned, and even to his old age serve him for hourly lessons? So he's just saying, yeah, what old, cool, learned person doesn't know all these classical, um, uh, you know, minds essentially, and uh, are able to, you know, just because they know some of their cool little quips and quotes and yeah. aphorisms that it's still obviously very, very intellectually nourishing or whatnot. But, you know, it's, it's funny cause I always find Sydney taking the words out of my mouth. You know, I, I had never read this when we, when we ever recorded our episode one or when we, when we even recorded the, the, the Sydney drop episode with the, the true Shakespeare uh, reveal. So I'd never even read any of this stuff beforehand, but I just found myself, he's like taking the words out of my mouth. Like I've already kind of yeah. called it the, the social cohesion of England itself. And he's literally saying, dude, Hungary's, Hungary's got all these cool songs. Spain's had all these cool, like little, you know, little awesome little zinger lines. Like I want to get that into English essentially. So he's literally, you know, like I said, the concept that I was looking for, like it's, it's already happened. And even with our episode one, where we sort of pitched it as a sort of group theory adherent to a you know right government sort of like long-reaching you know quasi corporational you know tinge to this whole thing right right right, um, right. yeah like i said social governmental uh enactments or whatever and so yeah it's just great to kind of see more confirmation of maybe some of those those lines of our theory sort of yeah uh, absolutely coming full circle here yeah and so yeah um, go back and watch episode one kind of see that we posted that over a year ago before i read this properly yeah um and yeah see like how much it's like oh yeah this is really this is pretty resounding especially if it's coming from the contemporary dude we're, we're trying to talk you know the from this from this period which is like the, well, how much more you know kind of right from a gun do you and, need and at some point for those people out there that want to be a solo theorist that swallows everything under the sun so like a phoenix that wants to say that all of sydney's being written by bacon um tell me like what would that line about hungary mean like bacon didn't no sydney's the one that went there in the 70s um like so much of this actually comes from an actual biography, from an actual person's mind. He we, opens up with, well, I was, we were talking with Maximilian the first here, and yeah. we got onto this subject of that's what this whole sort of thing is based on. Right, he's, he's having this conversation, or or he had a conversation with people that were, yeah, not in his country. So, and uh, so yeah, at some point, this whole idea of the birth of the individual, like you can literally find that in Sydney. That's how we know it is Sydney. Um, because he explains it as such that I want to put myself in the page. And uh, maybe that's why Brady and I are continually driven towards Sydney, even if you don't think he has viability as a candidate. Like, reading him 
is going to help you try to unlock whoever you think is in these other works. Because at some point, he teaches you how to read biography as you're reading. Like, um, and not just biography, but like politics, psychology. Like, if, if we hadn't been looking for Sidney as the Shakespeare author, would so many of these things popped up for us? No. Like, oh, we just, okay. Oh, he's kind of saying this thing about, uh, yeah, that's why it'd be good to write poetry. And it's like, no, he, he's not just saying that's why it'd be good to write poetry. He's saying this particular way of doing it is going to have a particular effect to, you know, and it'll be really strong effect. And, um, so yeah, this is like, yeah, you want to make the monkey see and do, well, this is how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and ironically, yeah, he's you want the monkeys to do all you got. This is what you show them to see. You know? And I mean, he kind of tells you also that like, this is an essay. Essays going to be under philosophical or historical. That's not part of poetry. Um, and so this this is for the learned, right? He tells you in this essay that philosophy is for learned people, and those are the people sort of already in the know. Well, this is an essay. That's this is for the learned people, and it's telling all the other learned people this is how you treat the non-learned people. And um, yeah, it goes back to any Shakespeare authorship questioner probably question Shakespeare because he seems to be in the learned group and to end on this learned thing and this will be a perfect way to wrap this up uh, I had mentioned it earlier in here Francis Yates the theater of the world and we had already talked about this once again kind of probably every episode even the 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 easygoing strap anti Stratfordian or even Stratfordian did have to be like well yeah look at all this Shakespeare must have read all this Roman Greek classical stuff and he must have been really good at Latin and he must have been into the sciences and he must have been into the everything right so Shakespeare must have like known everything but as we kind of showed we're going through Sydney stuff he's doing tons of references all over the place and not just to the classical stuff we've shown he's reading the yeah. other, he's reading the contemporary stuff so Erasmus yeah. and Agrippa that's only you know a few decades before he's born right, or whatever right, right. but uh, in the decades prior but yeah he's reading also the Spanish stuff at the same time knowing why that's working Okay, so in this book, she's going to go on about, you know, she, this is like one of the last ones she wrote, but she's trying to connect all the way from all this occult philosophy and eventually get to the stage because she has to do all these different books leading up to just the philosophy, just some of the basic movements, but eventually working towards something like this. And she's like, well, yeah, she's trying to figure out Shakespeare, but she does the really a lot of awesome groundwork building this way. But I don't know, Here, if y'all want to hear some red flags, here we go, boys and girls. So she's going to be talking a lot about John Dee, of course, and uh, his involvement in all this. But she was just kind of going in this early part of the book, talking about his library and how extensive it is. And there's so many people that you can go online and look up about all this stuff that he had. But I'm just going to read you this one little paragraph and, you know, just have your radars ready. Surely it is of the interest that we might now reconstruct the library in which Dee probably received these splendid guests. The divisions in the catalog into books of different sizes, impartial subject divisions, books on history, books on geography, the Lullus section, the Paracelsus section, and so on, may have actually represented the arrangement of the books on these shelves. Around these shelves, we may imagine Philip Sidney strolling, displaying the best library in England, and one worthy to rank with some of the best in Europe. And then it says, Oxford had nothing like this <laughs> to show like this. <laughs> She's talking about the college here, but yeah, it's, yeah. obviously it's in fun juxtaposition. So, um, And she says, yeah, the reformers had turned out its scientific works. But yeah, just that, you know, you got old John D, you know, his all wizard stuff, and then young, intrepid, you know, uh, precocious Philip Sidney, you know, perusing like these old grimoires and philosophical texts and texts from like across like the continent and yeah. texts from all over the place tales like, about it's like yeah King you can Arthur just go like oh, i'm writing my stuff uh, oh i'll just go on down to mort lake which is right next to the like the the walsingham house i believe is actually yeah. what it was it's not far from the cecils and walsingham places and so yeah i'll just meander on over there and just yeah write my shakespeare stuff and like oh i got like four different translations of like this roman stuff and these different like introductions and these different prefaces it's like dude this is crazy like i don't know like not only is it sort of the provocative image of like yeah that young scholar or apprentice yeah, like a wizard you know kind it's, of feel you know uh, when when people came up with this aristocratic uh, you know 
figure that should be the person behind the pin name, you know, the one that Walt Whitman kind of suggests and that um, Green Street says, yeah, that sounds right, but I don't know who it is. And um, a bunch of other people are like, uh, I'm sorry, not Green Street, uh, Green. Um, a, a bunch of people are like, you know, who could it be? And so when J. Thomas Looney comes out and says, hey, it's, it's Edward De Vere, it's Oxford, everybody's like, whoa, that fits the bill pretty good. Um, and, you know, other people said Bacon fits the bill pretty good. And they do. They like they do by at least the image that we've been able to re not we, but we as in, you know, human Western civilization, whatever. The the stories that are being reconstructed to help us understand who and what Bacon is, who and what Devere is. Like it sort of fits, right? But nobody fits better in this general sort of idea of what you want the poet, playwright, dramatist Shakespeare to be. Yes, he's got to be a genius like Bacon, but Bacon seems too much enwrapped in philosophy and science to ever have theater be his number one thing. Um, De Vere, yes, sure, he's he's all about theater, but... Yeah, we have the metadata points that, yeah. yes, involved with theater, correct. You know? uh, but he also seems to have kind of a messed up biography of his life that you don't want to put on to, oh, Shakespeare the perfect, Shakespeare the great, and um, furthermore, like, the, the poetry that we do have from Oxford, it's, <laughs> it's not very good. It's But see, like, uh, unfortunately, not. or unfortunately for people's arguments, it's like, well... That's the whole point. Is that we we don't have that stuff, and so we can't compare. That's right. the whole point of the narrative. Is that a lot of it's you know been hidden from us, or, and, and that know. could totally be true. But that that's what hurts people jumping onto the Oxford train in the first place. Is that like, well, he doesn't immediately call to image this genius on his own. You have to go and suggest, oh, he's already this pen name, or oh, he's already this pen name. Because if you go only on the documentation about Oxford, um, from Oxford, like his own writings, it's not great. And so, therefore, you have to go to all these other people that say he's great. And so you get all these dedications that say he's great. And, oh, Mira says he's great. Putnam says he's great. And it's like, yeah, but they also say some other things are great that none of us really give a, two farts about. Um, and, like, you know, it's not like he was the only name listed. It's not like they said he's number one. Mira's listed, like, 25, 30 names. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he wasn't he wasn't drilling all over Shakespeare, so it wasn't super evident to the people at the time with whatever he's got his name right. on that it's like the most lauded stuff ever. It's right. you know. Um and <clears throat> furthermore, like you can find people making those sort of statements and dedications and that sort of thing about other people too. Like uh, a lot of people thought Lily was just the best in the world. John Lily just he's the best. He's you know, the only reason Shakespeare exists because of John Lilly. And then people like Brian Vickers, who's a scholar now, is like, no, Thomas Kidd's actually the best. Uh, you know, Thomas Kidd's the real reason that Shakespeare comes up. And, of course, you know, the, the Marlovians out there are like, no, Marlowe was the best, and he's the real reason. And, you know, people like Thomas Watts, and pe uh, people say that Shakespeare is the heir to Watson. It's like, oh, maybe Watson's the greatest. And um, so there's there's a lot of those names, and sure, Oxford could be one of them or all of them, but the point is, yeah, Oxford himself don't we don't have that. Um, Bacon, we have some poetry from Bacon. It's not great. It, it's it's cool. It's it's nifty, but like actual like yeah, works of poetry that are publishable. Like as far as the Orthodox Stratfordians go, they love to say that these aristocrats don't know how to do that. It's like, oh, uh, well, I, I, you mean other than Philip Sidney, right? And they'll be like, well, he was a junior aristocrat. I, I'm sorry, you, you meant junior aristocrats can do it, but non-junior aristocrats, like, they're the ones that can't write. Is yeah. that what you're saying? And, and like, you know, um, <laughs> um, so um, the point being that Sidney, he's, he's got all of it. He traveled to all of those places. He, he's got this alchemical, esoteric, you know, uh, imperialistic sort of worldview um this protestant leaning worldview that has these like bizarre catholic tie-ins and and sympathies like 
all that just rings true. And yeah, I know it's very generic. It's very impressionistic. But just like... He was about syncretism. He was about sort of like... Yeah. You know, kind of find the, the middle ground between all of them. Right. Um, and so I'm not trying to push that Philip Sidney's every word in Shakespeare. No. Um, I don't even know if he's a single word in Shakespeare on his own, like maybe some other people quoting him. Um, Chances clearly said to me that only the Shakespeare stuff he doesn't like is not Sidney's. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, and like, ironically, like, uh, I, you know, early on I was never really into Richard II. I didn't get why people liked Richard II as much as they like Richard III. It's like, this isn't as near as cool or fun. Um, you know, as I said the other day, like, Romeo and Juliet's kind of down on my list, but it may be that those are the Samuel Daniel poems, and those are the ones that Sidney actually is coming in and saying, I'm going to write in here, and then for whatever reason, ducks out. Um, if, you know, and I don't think that's probably actually the case, but if that were to be the case, like, if the ones that we can spot most assuredly are Samuel Daniel, and if we're here trying to pitch that Sidney is indeed da Samuel Daniel, then I have to have some appreciation for those plays that I don't like, or else I have to, you know, say that this guy that I'm really into is writing plays that I'm not that into, but at the same time, maybe that does sort of mirror Samuel Daniel, that, like, he's not writing these cool big budget plays he's writing these closet drama kind of things and that um there's maybe some aspects of that in some of these mid-90s plays and blah blah blah, blah yada yada the point being that uh yeah like uh it's it seems like in hamlet for it, for instance it kind of been inception for quite a while yeah you know and trying to really get that one down well and like us as group theorists like um i want to pitch group theory because I, I want to just figure out who wrote every word in Shakespeare and I don't think many people believe that 100% of the words are by Shakespeare. I think some people think that there was editing done by Johnson or maybe even Bacon. Um, you know, Orthodox scholars say that there's tons of hands in there, you know, that Marlowe's hands in there, that uh, um, George Peel's hands in there, that... Uh, uh, George Wilkins' hands in there, Thomas Middleton's hands uh, uh, in there, maybe Lodge, maybe Green, maybe others, right? And these are all sort of pre-Henslow names. Um, and um, so it's like, clearly a lot of people are open to the idea that there are multiple hands in it. Whether or not they're all working together, we don't have to go into that conversation yet, but the idea that there's maybe more than one person putting words in there I think is compelling and we tend to we intend to go down that road yeah well I think we should uh, end it on that note and uh, you know I always end with nullius in verba you know not on noir word but maybe maybe yeah don't take our word for it go read this stuff because yeah like I said it's a good thought exercise in the craft of you know writing fiction in general and so yeah obviously he's not just talking uh, maybe from a MK Ultra government quasi uh, <laughs> viewpoint, but there is still some good nuggetry in here, as obviously we we uh, expounded on already. So we'll uh, come back with you, come back back with at y'all with a part three. Yeah, ho hopefully point. the last part. Um, we'll see. Um, got about twelve, fifteen pages left, and uh, then that'll be it for defensive poesy. Um, thanks for listening, guys. Um, stick around for more. Uh, keep commenting. Um, Keep liking, keep subscribing, pass the word on to others. Um, if you got suggestions for future ideas for videos, uh, whether Shakespeare authorship question or not, let us know in the comments. Um, yeah, as Brady said, uh, no, I'm, I'm going to let him do it. I, I don't Nullius know. in verba.